I'm going to start. Well, welcome to the Regional Urban Design Forum at the AI East Bay. Um, for everyone's information, this is being recorded, so um, plan accordingly. Um, my name is Brian Streisick. I am the co-chair with Jay Castle of this forum. We do a monthly program talking about urban design throughout the Bay Area, so please continue to join us at uh, future meetings. And we usually start by doing a few announcements. Um, I probably have too many of them, so I'm going to put them in the chat window, which is going to be at the uh, bottom of your screen. Um, and as we're going through this presentation, please feel free to add chats as you feel uh, led. Um, but overall, I think that we you know everyone in the area here has been dealing with the fires. So the AIA California is, um, has set up a fund to donate um, money to help um, the fire causes. So I think that'd be a, a noble cause for everyone to uh, donate to. And then coming up, which is really exciting for us um, and the Bay Area is the National Organization of Minority Architects National Conference. It's called Spatial Shifts and it's being held virtually in Oakland this year. And they have a wonderful um, event that they do minus the, con besides the conference, but an event that they do every year at the conference, which is a community service project. So on October 14th, they're having a San Leandro Creek Greenway community design workshop, which I think would be a lot of fun to join. Um, also internally for the AE East Bay, our design awards are due on September 30th. So if any good projects in urban planning or uh, buildings, please, um, please uh, submit your application at that point in your proposal. And then the AIA California Urban, Des urban Design Forum through, through that organization is doing a series of town halls and they have one on September 23rd uh, called Housing for All, which um, the first town hall was wonderful. So I expect this one to also be equally as great. Spur of course has lots of sev several events going on the next month. So look at their websites. And I think lastly is the Bay Area Housing Advocate Coalition is having their Housing Heroes Award in on October 7th. And they're honoring uh, Oakland's mayor, Libby Scaff. So um, I'm sure that will be a spirited uh, uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, I think we all should join that. So I'm going to copy these into the chat window and turn it over to Jay to introduce our guest tonight. All right. Well, um, thanks, Brian. I'm uh, really um, excited to um, welcome Marco Chitty uh, to our Regional and Urban Design Forum. Um, Marco is a PhD candidate at the University of Montreal in urban planning, and he has a uh, architecture and urban planning degrees, I think, as well, and has practiced as an architect for a while, um, and is from Bologna, where he'll be um, talking about their approaches to uh, preservation. And um, kind of the impetus for um, the event was a, a landmarking um, uh, controversy that happened in Berkeley last month concerning um, a, uh, a house that was uh, proposed as a landmark to some people think in order to prevent a 10 unit development from happening. This is a site uh, just a little bit north of downtown and a little west of Live Oak Park. Um, the house itself had been built for the, um, uh, the founder of the First Unitarian Church in Berkeley. Um, which is why it was nominally why it was proposed to be um, landmarked. Uh, and the landmark um, initiative came from a single person who was an architectural historian who felt that the, both the house and the historic, you know, use of the house uh, warranted landmarking. Um, and it was a, it, it became actually a national issue because Robert Reich, who was a former Clinton um, labor secretary, uh, actually weighed in on the project because he lives nearby and wrote a letter to the landmark board um, in favor of landmarking and had some concerns about the affordable housing um, that he didn't think would be provided as, as they were proposing as part of the project. Um, so, you know, basically what I, the, what this brought to mind to me is that the, we have this um, way of doing historic preservation 
uh, certainly in the Bay Area, but I think a, a lot around the country, that really weighs heavily on individual people um, uh, proposing a building be landmarked and, and not a more uh, thorough and wide ranging approach to, to preservation and heritage that um, some other places um, uh, utilize. So um, I, I think with that, I think that's enough background. I guess the, the, the final outcome of the, the landmark um, preservation meeting was to uh, deny the landmark for this house. And so the project can move forward, although it's still early on in the permitting phases and there are appeals that poten potentially could, be, could happen. Um, so with that, I think I'll just turn it over to you, Marco. Yep. Okay. Thank you for uh, the introduction. So I, I'm so I'm I'm going to share the screen so I can go to share this presentation. I think it will work. Uh, what is this? Ah, wait. Uh, no, no, this. Like this. So do you see my screen? Ah, who can share? Okay. Oh, oh that's not. I hope you see what I'm seeing. So uh, I, I tried because I, I, my, my concern when, when Jay invited me, I say, okay, it will be interesting to, like, to talk about what's, how heritage, heritage planning, like uh, how heritage is integrated in planning in Italy. It will be interesting, but how it can be useful on, the, on a North American perspective. So, so I try like, uh, so it's, it's a very complex matter. So it's, uh, uh, I mean, in Italy, heritage and says the, the built stock, the old built stock is very big. There are, there are a lot of buildings and Italy is a country of old urbanization. So it's a lot of uh, cities developed well before the industrial era. Uh, and so there is a lot to deal with. So the expertise developed like somehow naturally out of this situation. But so I try, okay, how can this be useful when I talk with people in the Bay Area? So to inform, like there are like different approaches that can be taken towards like heritage, even if in a different, completely different context. So uh, what, I, what I did, I try like to go and jump through to things like to highlight difference, and, but to highlight also which are the important positive and negative lessons. What worked and what didn't work uh, in Italy, which are the issues, which are the trade-off of how this approach came to be. So uh, like uh, Jay already introduced me, but uh, I think like even, uh, I'm a kind of person that has been flirting when, with urban heritage since uh, I graduate. So in Italy it's impossible, uh, it's almost impossible not to flirt with urban heritage. Like, I would say like for the five years I've been a, like a practicing architect, uh, I would say like half or even two third of my project has to deal in some form with heritage. But, and then you deal with it, like in our programs is very present in our like uh, teaching curricula. But also I like uh, ended up like working on it when I was like doing one year abroad in Bordeaux, in France. And I discovered the French approach is quite different somehow. And when I did my master thesis in uh, in Shahjanabad, like it's the old city, like the Islamic old city of Delhi, and I like used the Italian approach, like to work on this uh, area. And then I worked like on cultural heritage issues on uh, during the master plan of Jericho. It was an international cooperation uh, project. And now too that I'm working mainly my PhD is mostly focused on technical, like north to south technical assistance in urban planning, but with an heritage focus. Uh, so, so I went like the first thing I did is to go and see this article and understand. Uh, and as I went through the article and other articles, and to understand a bit how, uh, like I know already a bit, but how is treat like how urban heritage is treated in North America. So, I just highlighted some like sentences that are quite interesting for that, like the historical value of the home or like insistence on the person that lived there, the person that like built the house, the person that is behind this house as a reason like for like keeping this house because it has a value because it was the house of the founder of a, a local church. And uh, uh, at the end, uh, 
for example, like the landmarking commission has dealt with the similar conflicts, etc. Try to distance landmarking from the zoning and housing process. But several speakers said landmarking can't happen in a vacuum. So I maybe agree with this, but I will show how like planning differently than in North America is like heritage is fully integrated in planning in Italy in some sort. So the premises of this is that if you want to like to understand a bit the approach that we have in Italy, you have to forget about monument, the idea of monument and landmarking or landmark. Okay, it's not preservation is not the war. Uh, there is no concept or there is very light idea of the importance of a place because something historical happened there. Okay, it's not the palace of something, it's not the castle. I'm not talking about big monuments. I'm talking about vernacular. I'm talking about minor heritage, what we call minor heritage. There is nothing that we can call neighborhood character, nothing that can be translated directly in that. Uh, it's not a matter, it's not a problem of identity or of architectural style, uh, because a building represents an outstanding example of a typical architect or so on. It's not a problem of charm or of, of aesthetic. So that's that's the premises. Uh, just very shortly, because you probably know that the roots of American approach, I would go very, I'm, I'm not a specialist of what happens in North America, but it's the first important thing is that the municipal enterprise, so there are like national and uh, like federal and national laws, of course, but it's mainly something that is dealt with at the municipal level. And uh, like, Things that happened in the 50s and 60s to, as a reaction to the destruction of land of landmarks of monuments like of important buildings that everybody considered something that uh, need to be kept uh, so like New York City's landmark preservation law and commission that was established then New York New Orleans French Quarter Conservation District or like uh, the fact is most of the time landmarking has like it's done as a reaction for a building that is threatened and some individuals come up and say, no, let's stop, let's landmark this building because it is important. Uh, the same thing happens somehow in Quebec where it's municipal, like the responsibility of, uh, uh, for minor heritage. I'm not talking about national monuments or things like that. Uh, so I went to the Wikipedia page of, uh, of uh, historic preservation and when you go through, to the point like the idea of preservation is rooted in the, the Anglo-Saxon culture, then when you see like the countries that are listed in this, it's mainly England, United States, Australia, Canada, the Netherlands, and a couple, I don't know why North Macedonia, it's kind of, and Israel. So it's really like the continental part of Europe, it's missed from this discourse. And this is interesting because the, the roots, like I will not go into a theoretical thing because it's too much, but uh, when we talk about preservation of the built heritage, what do we do with aging buildings? Buildings are like people. They, after time, they tend to die. They tend to can become like outdated, not more necessary. So what do we do in the 19th century? This idea came with industrialization. Then there were like a, three like broad approaches. One was John Ruskin, the idea of picturesque, of uh, uh, ruinism, like let the building die slowly. Let them, like maybe preserve them, slow them down, but there is something in leaving the time flow and the building disappears slowly. But it was considered in Italy like a too decadent approach. I, I'm going very, it's more thick than that, but. And the other one was Viollet le Duc, like uh, the French, that the idea of rebuilding, like you maybe you heard the debate in France after what happened to Notre Dame. And the thing is that, do we rebuild that it, as it was, or do we leave it like that, or we do something modern? The French approach is most of the time, not always like this, what is called holistic restoration. So let's build as it was, or more or less as it was, or even invent something as it could have been done if they had the meaning to finish it. Sometimes, like uh, Carcassonne, if you go in southern France, it's an invention of Viollet le Duc. The Italian approach to develop in the same way, it's kind of third way in between the two. It's what is called philological restoration. I don't know if it's a correct translation, but it's like, okay, let's go in between. We do not rebuild the building if it's not there, but we will not leave it like go to ruin. But we try to keep it functional, maybe 
give it a new function, maybe show when we are adding something new because it's necessary for the structural reason and so on. And then there is also a big like uh, debate that developed later. But on a, this is like on building level. The way this was like kind of take on the urban planning level happened really on the beginning of the century. Let's say that uh, the protection of monuments is something that is very much acquired in Italian tradition. I mean, like the Coliseum, nobody wants to demolish it like three centuries ago. So there were already laws under the Pope state that they say nobody touches the Coliseum. But this like went into legislation, but it was like systematically uh, put in a national legislation in 1902 with uh, there is a body, like a national body with like so local branches that is kind of autocratic. They decide, they make list of monuments, not because someone comes, because they do surveys and everything uh, of public buildings, but also of private buildings saying this is an outstanding thing. So St. Peter's, Coliseum, uh, the two towers in Bologna, the, the cathedral, this, this, this. These are kind of outstanding monuments. Nobody thinks to demolish them. But what do we do with the rest? So cities are not made just of monuments. Like all cities are made of a lot of small, uh, not in very bad shape houses. Uh, uh, and when like a modern country starting to modernize, like to became a modern country, there was a lot of this dilapidated uh, minor heritage or vernacular heritage. What did you do with that? Like in, during, throughout the end of 19th, beginning of the 20th century, there were a lot of schemes to demolish the big boulevard you see in Rome that connects uh, uh, with the Coliseum was opened up. Like the, the forum, Roman forum you see like now was demolished a lot of medieval houses to open up like the archaeological area. So it was not like that. So it was quite normal for them to demolish even three, four, five centuries old buildings, but because it were just like minor buildings, like dilapidated, it was a, like a poor neighborhood and so on. Uh, the other thing is that in the, after the war, the war like added a lot of like destruction, but even after the war, like the reconstruction and uh, uh, ended up with this kind of massive uh, low quality, not everywhere, like it's not, but there was a lot of this massive low quality peripheries uh, because the country was developing fast, because the economy was booming, because people were moving to cities and they needed a place to stay. But at the same time, there is a like, kind of broad like uh, understanding in Italy that uh, like landscape and historic and heritage is part of the national like. Uh, um, uh, background, like, like it's, it's rooted in the constitution of 48 in, within the first uh, 12 articles, there was the idea we have to write this down as among the 12 founding articles that nobody can change, like uh, Italy is a republic, uh, it's not like that, uh, that's, and this, like an article, the, the republics of war, the natural beauties of the country and so on. So, uh, the this is the background where people felt the need like to protect this. The theoretical foundation for this in planning is what is called a typomorphological approach. So the idea is that, okay, like cities are made of large monuments, but we have to go beyond that. Like our cities are good places, interesting places, because they are a mix of minor buildings and uh, major ones. Okay, and the problem is how do we make this that was conceived in a different era with different needs, with different functions, and so on for the modern time? So like having, having like better, uh, like how do we bring modernity within the city? How do we integrate the city with the post, uh, like the industrial city, the industrial city? Uh, so there are like many people that were like uh, one, maybe the first is Giovannoni, but the background is in Camillo Sit that maybe most of many of you knows, but uh, it's uh, the idea is that we have to deal with it not building by building, but has at an urban level. So urban planning was developing as a discipline, as a practice, as a legal thing in Italy during the 20s and 30s. How do we do? How do we deal with this historic city? How do we integrate it in our modern city? So the the like the idea is that. We have to understand that those city, like those, this fabric has a logic. Uh, so they, as a logic that, and that uh, evolution over time, okay? So it's like, a, 
the basic components of a city's fabric evolved over time. So how do we understand this hidden logic that is behind the cities that is originated by the economics, by the social and everything? So the idea is like starting what are cities made for, is made of, is made of parcels, like pieces of land where buildings are built on. And this is the basic model of the city. Okay, not, I'm not talking about specialized buildings like churches and everything. I'm talking really about like the everyday buildings that make up the fabric of a city. So there are patterns repeating. Every city, there are differences between cities because of historical reason, construction materials, and so on. So maybe lots are larger or smaller, deeper, because this city was a merchant city, that other city was more a manufacturing city, and so on. So the idea is that there is a logic behind it, the logic of densification of plots, the logic of uh, growing in depth and specializing uh, by uses, and so on. And this is logic scale up at the block level, how these plots aggregate. And this is the logic that governed the densification over time of the city. Like, uh, uh, how do, does the structure along the main streets, how new streets were open, like to densify inner parts of the plots, and so on and so on. So it's, it's very deep, like it's very thick, and there is a very strong and theoretical background. Just believe me, I'm going very, very quick. But this has been like the ground for people to start, okay, let's use this. Let's use this tool to understand how historic cities are and how following this logic, not building by building, but in this particular place, there are particular construction techniques, particular uh, ways of uh, building, uh, using the buildings or openings and so on for uh, like historical reasons. And how do we build it in plans? So the first attempts were made in the 50s. Uh, like this is one of the most famous, uh, like the, the 1959 uh, plan for Assisi. And uh, like going in very detailed plan, like take the historical city. The historical city is, is a continuum, is a, is a single thing, and we have to understand it in this way. And let's like go building by building. It's a very time consuming activity. So they took two years like to go through everything, and do, but this was kind of uh, studied case for the time. But when really the first big city to go really deep into it was Bologna. So most of the master planning till the, let's say 60s, mid 60s, in most cities were like the big, the city center was left blank. Like, we don't know. How do we deal with the modern tool of zoning, even if Italy does not really have zoning in the way you can conceive it, but how do we deal with the modern planning with something that was not conceived with that? How can we apply something so we cannot? So how do we do with this that has this kind of shape that setbacks, uh, uh, distances, and all the kind of tools we have, uh, uh, FIR and so on, cannot really apply to that. The thing is that, okay, we have tools for uh, like monuments. How do we do with all the rest? All this kind of buildings that constitutes, uh, as I said before. So the idea is like, okay, Let's do as they did in other experiences. They were not starting from zero. There was already a lot of experimentation going on since at least 15, 20 years, a lot of studies. They went and they approved uh, like a change to the master plan of the city to make a detailed plan for the city, identifying buildings by categories of, in of intervention. On some buildings, you have to keep as they are. Other buildings, you, have, you can replace them. So if people can replace them, but they have to be in accordance by typologies of the buildings that are nearby, like uh, finishing materials, uh, uh, kind of uh, the way they occupy the parcel and so on. As I told you, like they can be even denser. They can, even, this depends on the building. It's a kind of very complicated way they did it. But there was a classification of buildings that were, were built bef uh, after a certain period and so on. So, this is, was like the regulatory, the statutory part. The other thing was, okay, but uh, we cannot expect the private to do everything. Uh, otherwise, some people can be expelled. There is like social problems. There were like poor neighborhoods in the old city and so on. So what do we do? So there was this occasion that uh, the law allowed to use plans for uh, funds for social housing and powers that were given to municipality to uh, expropriate the land for social housing, uh, to use also for like existing uh, dilapidated stock as a tool for urban renewal. So the municipality took this, uh, so let's, they, the political history of Bologna is a 
cities that has been ruled uh, since uh, I don't, not ever, but 19th century by socialists or communists. So it was very rooted on the left, like history, but very pragmatic, like very like used to administer, like the, there was a culture of administration. So the idea, was, okay, let's do this plan and identify some areas. We have fundings from the government. We could put some fundings. And so we apply this tool. So the idea was to took like, like cool parts of the city that were mainly dilapidated neighborhood with uh, one of what the street that you see in the picture was famous to be the, the, the street for prostitution or for a lot of like social problems and so on. So the idea was we have to keep the, the, the inhabitants in place but with better buildings. We can add even some density. So the building you see there, they look historical, but they are kind of just like rebuilt, partially rebuilt, partially a new building that follow the same logic because some plots were like on emptied, building uh, never finished and so on. So it was a kind of negotiation and design. They went through all block by block and by time, like it took like 15 years to make all the, uh, the areas, but they went in this kind of every single um, plot by plot, like making comprehensive plans, Redeve redeveloping these um, uh, plots and, and following this logic, even if you add some density, you have to be like in this uh, idea of how does this densify, like going deep in the plot with courtiers, with some kind of uh, uh, construction techniques and so on. But this was not like type of morphological tools are also tools of design. This is very important because it's not just a way to preserve something that exists, but also to operate on the fringe or on the march of some historical past. So the idea is really those historical neighborhoods have a good um, urban, char char not character, it's not a word, but there's urban quality. There is something that when people visit Italy, they say, ah, oh, cities are nice and the open spaces and, and everything. It's because there is a general like uh, understanding even among the public, like it's kind of, now it's a broad consensus that they have a quality. And for example, these were used like uh, Venice went very a lot like in redeveloping some old uh, factories in Judaica and other parts, like to make mix of social and like normal housing, but using this kind of like a, a modern language, but with kind of reinterpreting all typologies. This is one of the famous, I just show like a couple, but uh, there are many. This is uh, what uh, Gregotti Associati did in, uh, in Venice. So it's kind of, reusing this you see the kind of terraces that are typical historical houses in venice but with new buildings so they have lift inside so they can you know like it's you can add some new features inside finishing at the same kind of uh, like plaster finishing of venice but with some kind of concrete columns and structures but with this kind of open and paved space that are typical of venice the campi or like gardens so that are inside or for example, in a different context, in one of the little islands, it's another social housing. Uh, and this was done by Giancarlo De Carlo, always in the 80s, 90s. These are other examples like, okay, there is nothing to preserve. We're adding some new parts to the old city, but respecting somehow the logic, the inner logic of this like century old kind of development. This kind of idea, like to, to make it show, like the spread, like, everywhere in Italy. Now it's kind of acquired, it kind of evolved over time. There's been a lot of discussion. It has been applied very differently with a lot of experimentation in different cities, but it kind of became the norm in city, in, in Italy, but it spread also. Like Bologna kind of was very famous that what they did in Bologna in the 70s, because also this very strong social part. And it became very famous in Southern America. Uh, the 70s were the period of uh, um, a lot of uh, left-wing uh, municipal governments going on in many South American cities. And the international connection of those governments at the municipal level is very strong. It's also been very strong for centuries. And so it spread very fast, especially on a municipal level. And then it became, so if you see Sana, for example, was a plan that was did with the help of the Italian cooperation that really follows this kind of principles. Or Quito is another, uh, Quito is another example in Southern America, but there are many like in North, uh, um, in the Middle East, in North uh, Africa, like Maghreb. 
and also not very much known in America, but for example, maybe this is an example I know, maybe there are other examples, but this has been used partially in Quebec to a, to a certain extent because there were some professor from the Université de Laval that was studying in, in Florence in the 80s and then he discovered this thing and then he brought back to Quebec and now it's kind of in the 90s was like put 90s 2000 the legislation as the plan d'implantation d'intégration architecturale and this is an example that they've been given me like it's a it's it's kind of recommendation for example sorry yeah, that's mark ah. oh sorry and uh, for example, are like ideas, how can I add some parts to the house? It's not like you cannot touch this house, it's preserved. Even historical house, following some logics that like belong to the house, they can be um, like a large, you can make addings, you can make an ADU and so on. So this is a small village on the um, outskirts of the Region um, Metropolitan, uh, like on the metropolitan area of Montreal. The problem is that this also helped a lot preserving the historic centers of Italy. Every tourist enjoys so much when he comes. But the problem is the trade-off is that this park, it's my opinion, but not only my opinion, it's an open debate, a very uh, conservative approach to urban heritage. More than in most uh, European countries. It's very difficult in Italy. It's not impossible. There are very nice examples and it really depends if you end up in a Superintendent are these figures that are like belong to the Ministry of Culture that are in charge of uh, of this. But if some things is, is managed at the municipal level, by it depends from region because it's regionalized uh, legislation. But really, sometimes it's very difficult. But sometimes you have very interesting thing. It really depends on the local culture of how do you integrate in that, and also because. Like as I um, as I told you, like there is everybody's used to deal with heritage in Italy, in the profession, like in mom practitioner, it's normal. Like it's uh, it's part of the profession because of uh, things. So the problem is that there is this idealized image of the Italian city. I would say that is very sometimes detrimental to the innovation uh, or what can be brought or how we can keep like modernizing this historic uh, um, fabric of the city that has high quality, but this is not like something that we have like to fix in the, in the time. Uh, so for example, this is one of the, so you had this historical house in Berkeley. This was one thing that was on the newspapers for years. So the, the second entrance of uh, the Uffizi uh, that was to be built like uh, on, on the place of a building that collapsed because of uh, like a terror attack unfortunately, but on the, on their rebuilding, so they decided to make this giant pergola. So the, the, the winner of the, uh, the competition was Arati Zuzaki 21 years ago. And it's a news of two weeks ago. They finally going to build it. Probably the money have been allocated and the, everything has been approved. But I know this because of the, my professor of uh, uh, restoration in the school was the superintendent who approved this thing in 2004. So, you know, like it's, it's been a thing and a, a very open-minded person, very like, and he was in charge of this, but you know, like there's been a lot of debate and so on. So the problem is this, do we want the city to be transformed in museum or can we add modernity in it? Can we add good modernity? We, I mean, let's do a competition. Let's discuss about it. Let's take a couple of years more, but like, let's keep adding some new stuff to improve the quality of the environment. So. I'm just concluding, I don't know, I'm very bad for time respecting, so I'm, I'm, I'm just very, very fast. Uh, so can a similar approach work in Berkeley or elsewhere in the US? Maybe yeah, there are some, I think there are some yes, some lessons that can be drawn, like positive ones, and some other no. For example, uh, the, the problem of adding housing, densifying a very low density environment is less, present in Italy. So historic centers in Italy are sometimes too dense. So I'm, I'm showing you Bologna that is not a very dense historic center, but if you take Florence or Genoa or Naples that were very important commercial cities uh, at the time, you have like seven, eight stories historical building and it's not a single uh, natural light coming inside. 
and it's very, already very dense. So it's, this is not the problem. So it's already very compact. And even the city outside the old city is less dense. And there are more, more and more opportunity of redevelopment elsewhere. Uh, processual morphology, so type of morphology or processual morphology is another way it's called, like a morphologia processuale, because it's, it's studied the process of the city and that it takes it to go further. And uh, this uh, works very well in uh, deeply stratified environments. I, for my, I, we did some exercise here in Montreal applying it. It works in places uh, like Montreal historic neighborhoods that have at least one and a half century or two centuries of even like replacing building and going with densification. So the typical plex, Montreal plex, underwent some like degree of densification, adding space and so on. So it's kind of easier to work in this environment. For like new environments, like to work in this idea, it's, it's, uh, it's less maybe the tool, even if morphological approaches or typological, like broadly talking, not specifically that one, are can maybe a, like a, a technical tool that can be used to work on an urban level. General population growth in Italy is low to not say like stagnant or like uh, um, contraction, like as this is like we are kind of the Japan of Europe. And uh, so there is less pressure for housing, even if in big cities there is more pressure. So it doesn't mean like, and still like in the US, central neighborhoods are more desirable than outside or maybe most of the time. And another thing that helps is that in Italy, there is a diffused expertise, as I told you, in dealing with heritage among practitioner developers, the public administration, uh, it's kind of an environment that over time can of develop the skills to deal broadly with that. And not an, an, a, like kind of, uh, I know how, like it's, it's something, it's, it's a built knowledge over time within the system. So I'm not saying that this is not existing in the US, but it takes more time for, for my experience to get used to deal with heritage in this way, I mean in a, an urban way. Uh, what I think what the lesson that can be retained for uh, Berkeley are really that uh, in my understanding of most of North American approach is really a reactive approach when it's from of like uh, uh, heritage. So it should be a proactive approach. This will like improve, I think, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a possibility. Like uh, so, identify what is worth preserving like take your city say what's really important in berkeley what's really important in san francisco what's really important which part of the city has some outstanding character or outstanding like it's a historical part of the city maybe there is nothing I, I mean i'm not saying there is nothing but take it and like draw a line for what is important or not but this line has to be integrated in the general master plan it's not something that is unconnected from planning in general. If there is a high pressure on the city for development, maybe uh, I mean, the, the line can be drawn of what is worth preserving in a different position. So this is really something that has to be considered within the general frame of planning. So how many housing, how many houses, new houses we need to build? Are there different places? Because maybe there are like a lot of empty places near transit that are very uh, useful. It's very easy to build there. So maybe we can spare other parts of the city or maybe, you no, know, maybe, I don't know. Like it's a, this kind of exercise I think is useful. Another thing that I would say it's avoid to fetishize. I don't know why it's pronounced like it, but like it's make a fetish of building by building. The, the, the Italian approach is not a building by building approach. Apart from big monuments, the idea is that the building per se is not so important as much as the ensemble of the building. Not because in this building uh, happened something very particular. There is some like reason of preservation because it's a artist studio or something like that, but it's uh, a different kind of thing. It doesn't work on the same way. And uh, the thing is that if this historical environment as a, as a whole, as some, let's say, characteristic that make it a high quality urban environment that everybody can enjoy, 
I mean, we are always focusing on the buildings, but what is nice in Italian cities is that you can like walk around and enjoy this kind of uh, environment. And, you know, like Bologna has a lot of this covered, like uh, porticoes and so on. These are public thing. These are like private spaces that are like perpetually uh, bounded to public use. So it's kind of part of the environment. It, even in gr the greeneries that are inside the garden of someone, uh, everybody kind of enjoy about it if you can walk around. So it's, I think there is a balance between this kind of stuff. And in general, I think this can inform about how to like pay more attention to the overall quality as say of new development. I think that uh, a lot of people that say, ah, they were losing this or this or that. Uh, I, in the article that uh, about this redevelopment in Berkeley, people were, people were like talking about this tiki taki um, like new houses, like new like uh, multifamily houses. So I'm not like, uh, I think everybody has its own taste and there are many reasons why behind it, uh, one, someone can like something or not, but uh, I think it's a, a general discourse about the quality of the urban environment. So it can be about the streets, it can be about the public domain, or even how some private uh, uh, thing, like as in Bologna, porticoes, but even gardens, or even other stuff that are kind of half accessible or not, can participate to the overall like quality of the built environment that everybody enjoys, that is part of the public domain. So. I don't know if it's, uh, I, I went very quickly because I, I didn't know if I want to like enter into detail because it's too much, how does it work? It's uh, all the bureaucracies and think, don't think Italy is a paradise. It's a uh, like hellish bureaucratical country and with a lot of, uh, maybe for what I understood, starting to understand like North American context, planning is like, like building permit is easier somehow. I don't know why but it's easier to get it, it's a, the less messy process. But the thing is really, uh, like I went to also like just to conclude, it's really this uh, another article and it's really something, it's, I think it's really reveal a lot about how much we focus on the building itself, on the very much thing that we are spending, I think hundreds of thousands of dollars I know how much it costs this kind of thing to preserve a building that can be interesting and so on. But per se, it's a 116 years old building that we are completely taking out of context to be replaced in another place. And this has been done like in Luxor when they move the temples and so on. It's kind of, uh, but I think really it's a, it's a matter of like not like focusing too much on buildings, but on the city as a whole which are the characters, the historical characters of the city that can be also like on parks, on other stuff. I have a little like butterfly that is flying around me. So I don't know if I, I it's, it was useful or not. Um, if you have questions, uh, so please ask. <laughs> um, Mercedes had an interesting question in the chat. Um... Ah, oh, sorry. I'm, I'm no, not that's all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought we could start there. Okay. Um, let me check. Um, I, I, I just was wondering if when you, when you were talking about Bologna, if you were, uh, when you were talking about the way they approach the block, I'm not sure if you would say sort of the block, like a, a, a small sort of, I had understood that, let's say, block by block, they would approach each block as sort of a mini cell of the city and make sure it had all the elements like gathering and package. And, did I get that yeah, uh, there is an overall plan for the city center. So the city center has some kind of definition. So the building have been like uh, surveyed and every building has been kind of listed in some kind of broad type of intervention. Then going on the operational thing, so some most of the buildings are private so every private uh, citizen can go and ask for a permit and they have to respect some kind of rules this was really a kind of very specific thing of bologna that decided to intervene completely and do it like by groups of blocks decide okay if we have some fundings we can like uh, use some kind of uh, not loophole but like use this law that allow us like to to be more tough, to use expropriation and other stuff. 
it's not more the case now, but it was a particular period. And the idea is really, okay, how do we do with that? Like we have this block, we have this block made of this very elongated plots and some that are typical of uh, uh, most medieval cities in Italy, not everyone. Uh, Venice is different, for example, but this is the logic of how like normal buildings has been made, built for centuries and densified over centuries in Bologna. How do we deal with that? So some buildings are in good condition, it's just restorating. Some other buildings we want to add an elevator inside because they are going like old people are going to live there because there's, there was also a social program associated with the building. So the idea is that the, the, we take this as a design problem, not a building by building, it's a design problem on the whole area. So with a very conservative approach somehow, but even adding new buildings, but that fit within this logic, of buildings with by finishing by even the way they are like uh, uh, the layout let's say this layout with courtyards and elongated thing and with inner uh, courtyards at the end and so on so this was the uh, let's say the logic so they decided the, at that time they had this kind of operational plan but even there are also other experiences more like more recent uh, like Palermo is going with a different tool because the legislation and the funding is pretty different today. But it's what is called in our legislation like a, a um, uh, like a company for urban transformation. That is a private uh, uh, public private partnership. So there are a lot of dilapidated buildings, and uh, and the private does not have the will nor the money to like renovate it in central Palermo. So they they are going like identifying some priority areas and. With this kind of uh, public, uh, private public tool, try to mobilize uh, funding with some kind of public uh, like contribution and so on to go in and see what they can restore, what can be demolished, what can be uh, preserved, and it's a very it's a design process. It's a design process that is like built within the planning process. So this is yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I think I just asked a, a kind of follow-up to that question. Are you, are you saying too that in Bologna, um, at an earlier time, they, they actually had some government lending, funding and um, they used something like eminent domain to take the buildings over on a government level and then they, they, they fixed them up. With a, I understood that they had a kind of master plan and an area plan and you know, sort of a topology plan, it sounds like. But in terms of public-private partnership, this is the one in your Yeah, country. I mean, the, the tool has evolved over time. I mean, legislation in Italy has been, like even founding in the 70s, there were more money in the gen in general, like economy was stronger in the 70s and 80s in particular. And uh, now it's a bit more difficult, but there are like European fundings, like uh, the U European Union has run like uh, three, um, three big programs of urban renewal uh, for three years, it was called Urban One, Two, and Three in the 90s, 2000, and late 2000. And so, a lot of cities in the south, especially, they use this funding to leverage like private money, like to rebuild some stuff, and then maybe people going and live there, or maybe making some touristic destination. And then it's it's really a matter of process and discussion. But the idea is really let's make a whole process for the city and then maybe it can be like subdivided in smaller process but the the theoretical approach about how do we approach the re, the reconstruction of the building is that is that is rooted in this theory of uh, type of uh, like processor morphology or type of morphology but the operational tools have evolved really over time in depending on money depending on uh, it's really because and a lot of the transformation has been done by the private, of course. A lot of what you don't see is that if you have one of these historical buildings, you go, you apply, and then you have like kind of regulation. Some, some Bologna is a bit different, but some cities have a kind of a, a form-based code. It's not really like that, but it's have kind of a, how giving guidelines to the uh, designer, the architect, to how do you, in, like work on this plot. So something you have to preserve, something you can build new stuff, you can add a lift, you can add a, a kind of more you can build under there. And this has been like changing a lot because 
there are like more like conservative people that push for more don't touch anything some people say no we have to intervene more and that i mean even in my short career i have seen at least uh, four or five things changing uh, it's 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 a matter, it's a constant debate with some kind of general frame that everybody's agree on i think somehow uh, is there any other question i know i have I have another, but I just before before I go, does anybody have another question? Ah, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, Marco, uh, I understand that in in Beirut, um, uh, you know, the project downtown, uh, the famous Sunday, that that kind of public-private partnership model that was used to renovate one of the old quarters of Beirut after the civil war. Um, was really lauded, was really appreciated um, by other countries and held up as a model. Um, and I don't know, there were, there's been a lot of criticism of it because essentially what it seems to have done is to kind of raise an area, sort of tear down much of what was there and rebuild new in a nice way and very aesthetically nice, but they got rid of the old market and they removed the um, buildings that were used by people without a lot of money, and they made it sort of a cheap, wealthy area. Um, so have you um, noticed that as one of the kind of difficulties that can happen when there is sort of uh, revitalization of these heritage areas using these kind of structured government um, approaches, which could allow a, a kind of corruption to enter with sort of certain developers or programs being favored over others? So I don't know if I get everything because it's the, the volume is very low. Sorry. Sorry, I should have. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can, can you get just can uh, make a, a short like uh, summary of the question again because <laughs> I would like. Sorry, I was. Uh, I was yeah, just that's asking. very bad. That's much better. Thank okay. You. Yeah, I apologize. I forgot about that. My microphone's not working. No, no problem. Um, so I was just saying that my understanding of some other models. Well. I mentioned um, Solidaire in Beirut, mm -hmm. and I know that um, Barcelona is considered a very successful model. I don't know that much about these different models, but I understand in Solidaire that one of the problems, it's been very criticized because apparently it used the funding to, quote, restore this older area, which included some fabulous market, which I haven't seen. But instead, they basically took it down and rebuilt new buildings, very nicely done, but sort of for the wealthy. Um, and obviously that, that could probably happen anywhere, but um, I guess I'm, I'm interested in sort of this operational piece and, and how different countries have, like how that compares to Bologna, or I don't know how it was done in Barcelona, but I hear great things about the Barcelona method. I mean, Barcelona or, did a, a, a slightly different approach in the sense uh, that they, when they started really like to tackle the problem of the city in the 80s, that uh, like during the, the period of uh, going back to democracy after Franco. Uh, so I visited many times, so I, I know a, a bit more about uh, Barcelona. Mm -hmm. So like visited not just as a tourist, but as a, like a professional to do like uh, trips. And the, their slogan was like, uh, uh, I know how to translate, but like a cenizar el centro, like a, like a um, renovate the center and monumentalize the periphery. So the problem is that the periphery was very low quality and the center was a lot of dilapidated housing too dense. Barcelona is another city that was very constrained within its wall. It's like Genoa, if you've been, it's very, very dense, the old city, or like Naples. You have like seven stories building without, with very little like uh, light inside. So they went much more aggressive than what we would have done in Italy with demolitions much more demolition but even rebuilding of large parts of the because they say there is a lack of public space it's too dense and so we we demolish something we keep some stuff and what we rebuild anew in some areas uh, behind the cathedral this new market that is famous with this kind of uh, uh, covered uh, with the tiles colored tiles this whole area behind they did uh, like a, they built like buildings with the following a bit the typology but with much more like a modern approach sometimes using the old facades keeping on in italy it's much more conservative the approach you demolish only if uh, 
there is no other way because it's in a very dilapidated state and you know it's easier to rebuild and so on. In Spain, they did a much more aggressive approach in uh, this redevelopment uh, because that was their choice. And I, I, I find also the Barcelona model quite interesting. And it's, it's rooted in their problem of an overcrowded city center. The Beirut, like uh, I was in a conference uh, four years ago in Beirut, like at the um, Academic Ibanez de Beaux Arts. And they, so they, they were presenting the fam famous Solidaire project, that is the one that took uh, the old city center that was like ra ravaged by the war, by the civil war. The problem is that they went really on to reconstruction, like uh, really making some kind of fake Bit, the bit the French way, like a uh, le duc like uh, rebuilding in a kind of fake Moorish style, a bit inspired for what has been done in uh, uh, in like in uh, Dubai or all this kind of stuff, where they want to create like fake heritage at the end. I uh, personally, I don't think this is the approach. I I agree that we can use the way uh, some traditional, let's say, some historic. Uh, um, uh, fabric is done. Like I, I like very much the idea, like as type of morphology has this idea of to be used even as a tool to build new thing, but with a kind of dialogue with the past, at least in the kind of layout, uh, the, how the public, the, the relationship between the private and public space is organized, but with a more like contemporary language, architectural language. The, Creating a fake souk as they did in um, in uh, Beirut, I don't know. It's because it's it, at the end. It's there's nothing of the souk of the like spice market and everything that's quite typical of the Middle East or of the Mashhab. It's it's really like Gucci, Prada, and and the likes. So it's it's a commercial. It's a mall. It's a Moorish. So I, I have more like. Uh, ethic and uh, methodological and theoretical problem with this kind of approach. But this is, uh, I mean, every culture as Japan really rebuilt everything. They don't have the fetishism of uh, the, the, the material, for example. They don't have, they, they, they prefer to rebuild their temples that are now like very perishable material. They keep the knowledge to do this with traditional ways of building and use uh, like uh, make uh, wood without uh, iron and like sticking around and so on. But it's it's a different culture and it's a different approach. So I think every country will develop its own like uh, way to deal with it. Uh, so, I mean, there is really the, the public private thing they did in the in Middle East is, is very speculative sometimes. This is my impression. And in, in, in Beirut is really rooted in the cronyism of the, the state. It's, it's, it's a very complicated thing. The, the Solidar project was a, a big extraction of money, of reconstruction from a little group of people that managed the country. So this is a very particular thing. But there are very interesting examples in North Africa, like in Algeria and Morocco, and mm. of approaches that are halfway like more french in the sense they are more interventionist they prefer more like they demolish with less uh, preoccupation as uh, italy where we are too much <laughs> concerned um, to keep everything but it's it's uh, i don't know this is really the thing is i really if there is really a less i, I kind of repeat myself but uh what I think is really missed in North America is the proactive part of the thing. It cannot be made building by building because someone can up and say, oh, this is the building that my cousin, that was a very famous person in the neighborhood, slept here one time and he was living here. I'm not like kind of, kind of playing down the local history. It's important. But you have to do this in, in I mean, you have a lot of professional, a lot of people working on home. And when you do a, a plan, so when you, when I say, what, what do we want our city to look like in 10, 15, 20 years? This is making a plan is like that, basically. How do we want it? Like want more housing because we are desperate for housing. Where do we put it? Okay, there is no place. So we have to sacrifice a bit of minor heritage. Okay, let's go. 
but maybe we can keep this. This is very important for us. It's very distinctive. This area is very something. It's a character. It's something. So we can work on it, or maybe we can, because it's a thing that we can keep the building around and built in the. I don't know. This is a kind of reflection that I think lacks a bit in the planning process. For what I I see from like uh, as an external person from the results for the impression is that at least in Canada that I know more this is what is lacking. There is a plan, for example, for the historic part of the city, like the very old city of Quebec, there is a preservation plan and everything. But for example, even in Montreal and in Quebec City, that has a very like nice and extensive area that is behind the, the like the wallet city everybody visit. There is a very extensive area of the 19th and early 20th century. There is no vision. Like for example, they maybe they keep the buildings, but they have this dilapidated streets and sidewalks that are quite typical of many neighborhoods in uh, North America, for example. And this, this part, if, if you're not working on the public domain, that is what is, everybody's enjoying. I don't know, like, I don't want like, to mix up too much stuff, but uh, it's, it's very, it needs in general, for me, it's my, my opinion, to be more proactive, to decide what do we want to do, what do we want in 20 years, more or less, like it's not it's like, a, like this is the kind of discussion that has, we are desperate for housing. We want to keep some kind of historical thing. Uh, the, uh, like trees are important and the transit is important. This is important. And then sit on a table, <laughs> I don't know who, how, which, within which process, but like to have this kind of discussion because these plans that I, this approach that I show you come both from a reflection within the practice. So something like it's, uh, if you take like the, uh, the professional journal of the 50s, 60s, there are a lot of discussion examples, what do we do, and books and things. And then some, with experimentation integrated in the governance process, some, something were invented from scratch. They were not, there was no legislation. Like, uh, the, our, like our planning law is quite generic, and so it makes a lot of room for uh, municipalities to invent. Now, uh, b before, like now there are original laws that are much more detailed. That at that time in the 50s, 60s, the law was pretty broad and was kind of generic uh, indication of, so there was a lot of invention, a lot of experimentation that really brought some nice stuff up that were experimented and ah, this doesn't work. The, the plan of Bologna was, was heavily criticized for many, for many parts. Like, okay, it works, but there, over time, a lot of people have been excluded, and over time, uh, we are fixed, or we didn't take the occasion of uh, improving some of this because there's not enough, maybe, natural light, or there is not enough uh, quality, and, uh, uh, you know, like, accessibility uh, is not the best. Uh, so it's parking a car in this area. So it's not a car-oriented area, but it's, uh, it's really... This is our problem, like how do we deal with modernity within the historical context, the necessity of the city? So, I mean, this is a kind of conversation that should, must be done at a certain point everywhere, I think, if we want to, like it's not a compulsory, <laughs> of course. So I don't know if uh, I can add something or, I know. Let me know if there is something that. Anybody else with um, questions? You can either speak up or type something in the chat box. So, Marco, there must be similar situations in Bologna, or just since that's what you're kind of thesis of this presentation that have neighborhood groups that know more about a certain building and they come out and say, we don't want anything to happen there. I mean, it has to be like, I, I'd assume it has to be the same. If people are people and um, we all have our, our agendas and reasons to do things that are there examples that you know of similar to a Berkeley one? Where yeah, of course. Happening? Of course, of course. There are, there, are, there are plenty. Like people are the same everywhere in the world. Like uh, uh, one thing that is different is that, uh, let's say, the the preservation of the historic center is kind of consensus. 
like some tentative to like introduce some modern stuff some people raised the eyebrow like um and there were discussion and everything but to a certain point i think when further i mean the, the participation the way the public participation works in italy is it's different uh, the it's it's not built into legislation it's up to municipalities there's been some introduction in regional laws but uh, um Italy is uh, the way the public life works. It's changing, but it's um, I know if there is this word in English, but it's the intermediate corpse of the society. It has always been a mediated participation through um, through political parties, through uh, cooperatives, through um, unions, through association, through um, and so on. So there has been people like raising up and everything, wanting this and public, but the, the, the municipality has much broader power to act. So they would pay it in the election, maybe. It happened, like we were about to have a tramway system in the late 90s, they were starting works. And that was one of the reasons, but there were also other reasons that for the first time in um, 90 years, Bologna didn't have like a left wing winning and the project was dropped. And there was Nimbus, but like, and now we are probably going to have a tramway soon. And uh, what are we paying? Like, we don't have one want one wires in the city centers because it's not nice, and all the kind of usual stuff. But if the people are opposing, they are going to public participation processes, like a, a kind of public outreach, I would call it, like public outreach process, and like uh, making demonstrations and so on. But uh, if, the if there is a, ma a political majority within the municipality that is for this project, the project will go further. There is election next year, so if they didn't win, if they don't win, maybe the project will stop again. But the re I mean, it's very built. Uh, it's not that it's not an democratic, but the way of uh, democratic participation is different. There is debate uh, on different level. For example, there were like new developments that were. Uh, so there are people that raise hands and then it starts discussion and then uh, if you have like to gain some political uh, people inside the city council to say eh, no like, let's stop but it's not like uh, going to uh, a public meeting there is no compulsory public participation but there is there is debate there is uh, people that dissent there is uh, projects that are stopped uh, because uh, uh, maybe they are not so sure about it. There is, there are like local referenda. They are not uh, like binding. So, for example, if people are like raising up, like they collect enough signatures, they can call for a local referendum to stop a project. For example, a municipality project, not a private project, like uh, the tramway, like as I said, like the LRT. And uh, but like that, if, even if the the um, people oppose it like uh the the municipality like the mayor can decide whether yes or no and if people are not uh, happy they he will pay in the next election and he will not re like be reelected again it's it's a it's also different because for example we don't have like uh, um constituency of the local level i mean like uh, city councillors are elected on a citywide list on a proportional basis Okay, so they, did, they do not belong to a neighborhood. They do not belong to an area. They do not represent a particular district. They represent the city. So they have to build the consensus mostly on, uh, so I, I have a friend who was like the uh, council member that was working on the mobility stuff. So he was like the chief of the mobility, minister of the mobility for the city. He was elected because he was always engaged in like cycle, bicycling and so on. He had a base. He got uh, 10,000 people voting for him, and then the people the most get preferences in the ballot. The most, the like the those that get the most preference get in the city council. The 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 the, the mayor has his majority, if the and goes on for five years, and then after that uh, another election, and they, they keep on like it's. Uh, but th there are ways for people to like raise their discontent and so on. 
but it's 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 easier than in the US, for what I understand, for this for the for the city to go on with projects, to carry on the projects if they want. Maybe they stop because they are scared of losing the election, or uh, it happens like it's. Uh, but they have the power of going on, like it's uh, it's it's choice to stop. So it's 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 a different way to manage uh, public participation in projects. It can it can like uh, it can backlash uh, like in uh, for the high speed uh, rail in uh, between Turin and uh, um, and Lyon. Like the new tunnel, they 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 was supposed to start in 2005, and then they get a, a very strong in unexpected because they did like everything behind closed door, and then at certain point uh, they were starting to like dig the thing, and people were absolutely unhappy in the valley of the where it was supposed to go uh, because it's a huge infrastructure, and there was a, a kind of revolt. They stopped the project, and then they went through another. Very strong participation, but again, not because some people, because a lot of local elected, like mayors and so on, like they went and they back of this, and they went to the like uh, regional level and they say, no, it cannot be done like that. You have to be involved. You have to have a say on how it's done. So it's, and then they stopped it and they went back to the drawing board. And then again, they are starting this year, 15 years later. Build. So it's uh, there is no perfect thing, but it's. Uh, I mean, I think it's a bit easier in Italy to go when you have a project to go and do it. The difficulty is on a bureaucratic level, on funding level, on different level. But municipalities have probably more to, more tools to act. For what I've seen, compared to what I've seen in uh, in North America, that I don't know, like every country every single state there are a lot of differences but yeah i have a question yeah quick question um marco what do you what is your focus um right now in um montreal are you are you studying a particular country maybe i missed this maybe you already said this uh, no, I, i'm working on like my thesis is about like technical cooperation you know like technical assistance so, so what is technical assistance exactly? Yes, technical assistance is a particular kind of aid-based, uh, uh, like knowledge-based uh, international development aid. Like so, uh, some countries don't know how to do things, like the idea, the idea behind it. So send them some experts from developed countries to teach them uh, how to do stuff. So there is not enough local capacity uh, to, for planning, for example. I'm doing things on planning. So I'm really studying on a very ethnographic level, how does this kind of uh, cooperation between, so like planners coming from European country, in my case, going to uh, a local, um, so I'm, I'm doing like the, 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 the projects I'm studying are in Palestine, like in the West Bank. And so it's working on heritages, like making plans or making some kind of conservation plan for heritage areas and so on. So I'm focusing on, things that are related, not only to heritage, but it's more like even landscape or cultural heritage. It's a bit different. It's not really on an urban level, it's really on a territorial level. And which are the, uh, really the, the problems that arise in this kind of context. The cultural clash, uh, the uh, organizational problems, the fact of working within uh, a context that, uh, is not very interested in the outcomes in reality. So technical assistance, it's its a very particular, I worked on this kind of stuff. That's why I decided to do a thesis on that because it's a, its much more complicated than people think. It's a, it's a failure. Like the, the amount of money that are like distributed around the world for international aid, for me, it's a waste of money, like a biblical waste of money. I'm, I mean, I'm just like generalizing a bit, but there is, there are very, I mean, if you really want, especially in technical assistance, to help people, help people there, they are very good, like professional in these countries, like make, for example, um, scientific publishing free for everybody, not in a monopoly of five uh, 
um, international like Routledge or all this kind of like, like that Taylor and Francis, this would help make a lot of exchanges for people to like me, I'm coming here, teaching, to, talking to you. And okay, you know, like in Italy, it works like that, not without telling you, you have to do like Italy because it's the best thing ever. And in technical assistance, most of the time there is this attitude, not personal, like most of the person I have seen, I talked with are decent person that are very open-minded, but the idea is that there are some knowledge people coming from the North, going to the South and telling this, uh, uh, savages how to do things i'm exaggerating like I'm, yeah you know, interesting but the, 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 the back idea that uh, informed this kind of thing unfortunately it's a very colonial or post-colonial if you prefer but it's this is the background then if you go into like uh, everyday relationship between people is much more positive there's something going on not maybe not the i mean the idea of the cooperation that we go there we teach them a couple of stuff and they will be able to do stuff. It doesn't work like that. Over time, a lot of people built a knowledge or a relationship and uh, there is something that comes up, but it's not something that you can just snap your finger and it's done. So that's, uh, that's what I'm working on in uh, my PhD that is almost finished. <laughs> Congratulations. Cool. Thank you. So I don't know if I can, I don't know if you don't even know the time. Yeah. If I can answer more questions or. We've got a few more minutes if anybody. Can I ask a question? Yeah, of course. Uh, what is the possibility of restoring the canals in Bologna? Okay, that some are, there is a project connected to the tramway project. Um, one of the canals that has been like closed in the 60s, I think, like after the war, uh, the Canale di Reno, that is abroad, like uh, with the construction of the, uh, the tramway, they are going to reopen a 200 meter stretch. And partially, that, that there is a parking built on it now. So people will start to scream, they are losing parking sites everywhere, like it's the same thing. But they are kind of opening up this part. And uh, there were like more projects, but they were dropped in other areas of the city. But uh, the nice thing is that the, the part that is outside the city center, because the canal starts very far from one side and continues to the other side. A couple of years ago, uh, they, they create, like they restored several places like the locks, like it's like 15th century locks that are very nice. They restored them. So you can have uh, like a bike trip of several kilometers from where the canal starts to the other side. So maybe they are going to open, but even Milan is thinking about reopen uh, its canals. Uh, it's, it's a project like of 200 million, so I think they will never do it, but because it's not the kind of money <laughs> there are around in this moment, but maybe with the recovery fund or something like that. But yeah, maybe there is, uh, I think what this, at least this little stretch will be reopened with the uh, tramway. Uh, thank you. Right. So I think we are done. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I'm going to yeah, eat. Yeah, thank you. It's kind of 9.30 here. <laughs> oh. Yeah. It's Montreal time. So I'm, we are three here, three, three hours, three years, three hours behind. Right, no. yeah. Um, so, yeah. So Marco, I just wanted to thank you um, for joining us. It was really interesting. And um, I also, I failed to mention in my intro that the reason this came about and how I found Marco to, to um, present to us tonight is he is a great person to follow on Twitter if you're on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> several times a week he puts together these Not really. <laughs> um, tweet threads on urban planning issues and, and it covers all different kinds of bases and uh, it's, it's really fun. So if you're on Twitter, uh, you should follow him and if you're not on Twitter, you should get on Twitter to follow him. Um, so uh, I think with that, um, thank you so much, Marco. Thank you. Thank you to you for inviting. Thank you for having me. Like, yeah. So I hope it was uh, funny. <laughs> and very, was, very fun. Very interesting. Yeah, it was fantastic. All right. So if you want, I can, I, I don't know if the presentation I can give you with some people. By that would itself. be great. Yeah. Yeah. If I can you send you by email. Great. later. 
and it's recorded as well if people want to oh, go okay. there so, too, so but i can send you like the pdf later that'd be great okay good okay so thank you very much thanks <laughs> bye thank you bye bye good Take night yeah, good night good afternoon good night <laughs>